Well, the two most important things are like, first of all, like accept that you're going to get frustrated. And if you get frustrated and you have a hard time, like don't blame yourself. Like it's not that you're stupid or it's not that you're not capable of programming. You're experiencing exactly the same thing that like everyone experiences. Data Science Conference and today with us we have Hadley Wickham. Uh, he is our keynote speaker here and uh, he is working on uh, tight diverse packages for R. So uh, you are very popular in this community <laughs> but uh, how would you describe your one typical working day? So, so I think the way that I try and start like every day is by writing. So I'm normally like working on a book or some other kind of big piece of writing. So I try and like the first thing I do like after I get up and make a coffee is like write for an hour or two. Um, just because then even if you don't like achieve anything else <laughs> for the rest of the day, you've still like put something in. And I, I think that like I think that, that being able to like spend some time writing is like it, it takes a long time to write a book, but if you spend like an hour on it every day, it, it, you know, it's only like a year or two years to, to write, a, a write a book. So I think that, that that's like really important to me. And then the other thing that makes my day a little bit differently is I only check email twice a day. So I, I use this tool called Batched Inbox, which means I only get emails sent at 9 a.m. and 5 p.m. And that's just really nice because rather than having like emails like drip, drip in all day and interrupt you, you just like sit down and deal with like 20 or 30 emails at once. It doesn't take you very long and doesn't interrupt other stuff. Yeah, great habits for, I guess, for a productive day. And so uh, you've been working on Tide Diverse for some time now, and uh, what can we expect from it in 2019? So one of the things we've been working on like this year is to try and avoid like, one of our goals is to like not do any big new things, but just to make lots of like little smaller things work together better. And so a lot of it's like, called, like spit and polish, just making things like fit together, getting rid of lots of little bugs. So I think next year we're going to tackle some kind of bigger things. I think, like two of them, I think, um, the first one is this, this vectors package, which I talked about in my keynote today. I don't think that's going to like directly impact how um, data scientists use R, but it's going to help us, again, kind of write code that throughout the tidyverse is more consistent and easier to use and will fix kind of a bunch of like smaller bugs in DeepLyer and TidyR and Perl. And then the other thing I've been thinking about more is sort of like reproducible research and how can we make it easier to, you know, make sure your code is reproducible and like code that you wrote like six months ago, how can you easily rerun that today even if a bunch of the packages that you use have changed. And so I really like this idea of kind of retrospective reproducibility. So normally when you set out to do, so I think today, like you can do prospective reproducibility pretty easily. So if you decide like from day one, this is a really important project and you want to do it reproducibly, you can. But typically like that's not how you discover you need to make your code reproducible. Just typically it's you go back to code that you wrote six months ago and it doesn't work and you're like, oh, this is so frustrating. I know it's a package has changed, but I don't know which one. Um, so we're trying to think about how can we make it so that, how, like how can we kind of automatically capture information so you can kind of roll back and say like, I want to roll back to where I was six months ago in terms of packages and have this code just work. Awesome. Uh, I also caught this part in your lecture uh, where you were saying how some uh, older packages or some uh, other programming languages will have bugs that you don't really see if you don't know the theoretical side of mm -hmm. things. So what would you say, should you first learn theory and then do practice or should you first do practice and do theory or are they both okay? I think like, I think most, most people are better off learning like the practical side of things first because it like it keeps you motivated like when you're learning R you, I think the way you should start is by learning visualization because it's like fun you see something you get this like immediate payoff whereas if you start by learning the theory like for, for most people don't find that very interesting and it's hard to keep your motivation up um, you know there's certainly like some like weird people like me who really like to go into the theory but I think that's like the exception 
rather than the rule. So always better, like whenever you're teaching, whenever you're learning, like start off with like practical things that keep you motivated, keep you digging into the details and help you deal with like all of the little frustrations you face along the way. Great. So uh, we can add here the questions. Uh, your top tips for like learning R and doing R for maybe beginners or maybe even advanced people? So I think for, for learning R, I think like one of the most important things, or for learning anything really, well, the two most important things is like, first of all, like accept that you're going to get frustrated. And if you get frustrated and you have a hard time, like don't blame yourself. Like it's not that you're stupid or it's not that you're not capable of programming. You're experiencing exactly the same thing that like everyone experiences. And you just have to like accept that you're going to get frustrated and you, you accept you're going to be bad at it for a while. But you have to keep going anyway. And to do that, I think one of the, the most useful ways of doing that is to not learn by yourself, but like find other people, like find a community that you can learn along with. Um, so I think that, you know, maybe that's finding like a local R meetup or an R ladies meetup if you're an R lady. Um, or, and there's other things like there's a, a really neat um, R for data science online community organized around my R for data science book, which is just like a really just fun community that will like kind of keep you motivated like when you get stuck you know maybe no one else will know the answer but at least they'll be like hey like this happens to all of us like don't worry about it uh, keep on keep on going yeah great tips thank you and um, there this is uh, the question we had um, is R merging with Python in the near future or or should we not expect that I, I, it's not going to merge <laughs> I think um, like over time, we're going to see the R and community and R and Python communities kind of collaborate more. I think so. One of the the recent projects that I've been involved with is this um, project called Ursa Labs, which Wes McKinney, the author of uh, Pandas, the very popular Python data manipulation library, is working on. Is is, is working on. So, so Ursa Labs is kind of joint is like hosted by R Studio. So we kind of provide like the, the infrastructure, like we're paying you know, paying for wares and some engineers. Hopefully there'll be other people contributing as well in the future. But, you know, really what we care about as a company is like, you know, we, we're, we're called our studio. Like, we, we love our, we think it's awesome. But we also want to make it as easy as possible to interop interoperate with other communities like the Python community. You know, that's thinking about like, how do you transfer data as easily as possible? Um, between different languages, that's Wes's current project, it's called Arrow. It's all about how do you store like modern data science data in memory as efficiently as possible and then how do you share that across programming languages. And then we've got a bunch of other projects at our studio, hopefully making it as easy as possible. Like if you mostly use R but use a little bit of Python to make that easier. And then our commercial products to like make it easy to publish both R notebooks and Jupyter notebooks as well. So not merging, but definitely <laughs> yeah. coming closer together. Yeah, great. So do, do you have something to add maybe? I think that the one one other thing I'd like to talk about because I've just a I just released this package and there'll be a blog post about it very soon. Uh, there's a new package called Conflicted. And the idea of the conflicted package, so normally in R when you load two packages and both of those packages have a function with the same name, the last loaded package wins. And like that can be really confusing because like when a package, sometimes when you update a package, it adds a new function that overrides a function you previously used and you don't get like a nice error message. You get something like really cryptic because now you're just giving completely the wrong thing to a new function. So the, the goal of the conflicted package is to make any conflicts like that, any ambiguity like that, an explicit error message to force you to resolve it. Um, and so this is... It's sort of like it, it feels a little bit weird to me that sometimes the right thing is to like loudly throw an error, but I think conflicted just like solves this whole class of problems by making them explicit. Um, so like try out the package and stay tuned for the, the blog post in the near future. Awesome. We can also link the blog post in the video. And thank you so much for the interview and thank you for coming to the conference. You're very welcome. Thanks for having me. Thank you.